actually started life in Trinidad, which is a Caribbean island, and actually fondly known as Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I I won a scholarship uh, there because we did the British exams at Oxford and Cambridge. I won a scholarship to Oxford to do my master's in English literature. And, um, and that was all great. And I was going to do that. But in order to do the exam, I had to research a bunch of Shakespeare and, and poems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in doing so, I came across an Oxford professor who had written something psychoanalyzing the tragic heroes. Uh, so Macbeth was, uh, at the time, it wasn't called bipolar, but Macbeth was manic depressive, King Lear had senile dementia, um, Lady Macbeth was obsessive compulsive, and Macbeth was passive aggressive. And I found that really, really intriguing. And so I went off and got Freud and Jung and stuff and started to read it. And I thought, holy cow, this is great. I want to be a psychiatrist. And of course, uh, I went to school with nuns, and so I didn't actually do any science. I mean, I, did, I knew H2O was water, and that was great. But I did math, and I did uh, uh, geography, I did Latin, I did languages, uh, Spanish, French, and I did lots of the, the literature. Anyway, um, I was told, like, well, you can't do medicine. You have to go get a bachelor degree in, of science and do medicine. And so um, my family doc, uh, who... Um, was a great guy and he kind of got interested and he decided to search if there was anywhere I could go um, without a, a science degree. And at the time, RCSI was doing um, a, a, a five-year project in which they were, they were suggesting that medicine was an art informed by science and not a pure science. And so they wanted 10 people in their pre-med class who were going to uh, prove that. So they took 10 people who had the top of the bell curve in their marks in whatever arts and humanities literature that they did. And so I got in because my marks were top of the bell curve uh, internationally. And so I, I, I got in. Now, it meant I had to give up my scholarship to Oxford, which my father, we were not rich at all, you know, we were kind of, my father was a tailor and my mother was a receptionist. Mm. So anyway, they had savings, they were saving for a house, and they decided that if I could get in, then they would pay for me to go to RCS and I would give up my Oxford scholarship, and I did. And I, I went to RCSI and I had a year a pre-med year in which to learn physics, chemistry, biology, and all of that. Mm. And so otherwise my parents would have wasted their money and I would have lost my scholarship to Oxford. So I did, and here I am. I stayed and I graduated from RCSI in 1968. Um, at that time, my, my ex-husband, Peter Fry, was British, and we were thinking of going back to the NHS in England, and it uh, turned out that that was falling apart at the seams and and the quality of care and everything was terrible. And at the same time, Canada was looking for doctors. Uh, people who, tra who actually graduated in the quote unquote British Isles, but Ireland was included. So my, my degree was accepted. Well, we didn't, you know, RCSI gave you the licentiate and that was accepted. So I, um, I started to practice medicine here. My, uh, Peter got a, a residency in, um, in, vascular surgery, which is what he wanted to do. And we ended up in British Columbia and we stayed here and I've been here since. Um, I had been, we had been thinking of going to the United States. The United States was aggressively headhunting. And so we got all kinds of offers to come and we were getting starting bonuses, 200,000 and a house and working for an HMO. And, uh, and it was all great and wonderful and bon you know, bonuses at the end of the year, starting bonuses, et cetera. And then I was reading about this country called Canada, which I had studied in school because, you know, the Caribbean is Commonwealth, the Canada is a Commonwealth country, and British Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And so I found out that there was a man named Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who was a prime minister of Canada, who had written a book called The Just Society. And it talked about creating a society in which everyone had equal opportunity and in which you didn't have to choose between putting food on the table and an education and you didn't have to choose um, between, uh, you know, 
education was important and they were looking for doctors. And I thought I wanted to be part of that society. It sounded exciting. So I we went to Canada. I didn't particularly like the system in the United States. Of course, Canada had a universal health care system somewhere. You know, the Canada Health Act made sure that everyone had access to health care regardless of their income and regardless of where they lived in the country. So I like that idea. And, um, you know, coming from a family that struggled to choose between an education and a home, I thought, you know, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to start my life and build something. So mm. we went there and, and uh, Peter got into UBC to do his residency. And um, I started having babies and worked part time at family medicine because I wanted to do ob eventually graduating from wanting to be a psychiatrist to having finished medicine and having wanted to be, you know, a neurosurgeon. And, you know, as you do in medicine, you sort of change what you want to do every time. Mm -hmm. And I finally decided I wanted to do ob -Gyne. And so um, we waited until he'd finished his residency and then I was going to have had the kids and then I would go into into a residency for ob -Gyne. It turned out that I spent much of my time doing part-time family medicine and in 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 Canada family medicine is you got to work in hospitals you had beds in hospitals you were able to you were the bread and butter of the system you know you got to see everybody I learned to like that I got to do a little bit of psychiatry I got to do a vegan I got to do pediatrics I got to do all kinds of things and I got to interfere in the lives of my patients mm -hmm. and so it was it was during that time that I actually learned how to practice medicine from my patients who taught me, you know, about medicine, taught me to be non-judgmental and, and taught me that, in fact, family medicine was about how everything related to everything. In the meantime, I had come, we'd come to Canada and the first thing I did was join the Liberal Party, which is because Prime Minister Trudeau was a Liberal. And I didn't do much. I put up a sign on my lawn and I donated a little bit of money um, to the party every year, et cetera, et cetera. But I was still a carded liberal, so to speak. And then I went on and I joined the British Columbia Medical Association. I got very involved in that. I actually became the president of the British Columbia Med Medical Association, eventually chairing lots of committees along the way, got involved with the Canadian Medical Association. But I eventually moved from, from that. I got a call and I got asked if I would come <clears throat> and chair the co-chair the health and social a part of what, what he called, what was called then um, a conference was, that was going to lead to creating their policy platforms. Uh, it was called the ELMA conference. So I went and I co-chaired it and I thought it was kind of intriguing, et cetera. And then I got, I got one day uh, after we were, they were prepping for elections, et cetera, I got called by Jean Chrétien and I asked if I would like to run and I said no and then he asked me a second time and I said well no I think politics is a bit of a scuzzy business and why do I want to be that I'm quite happy where I am thank you and I was prepping to be the Canadian Medical Association president the following year eventually he asked me a second time and he said look you've come to this country it's been good to you are you going to put something back and because I was a bit of a smart ass I said, oh, you know, look, I pay the highest income tax bracket in this country. I think I'm putting back. And then he, then he said, OK. And then he asked me out for dinner and, I, and his wife was there. And he asked me, he said, I'm asking you for the last time to run. That was a third time. He said, I've been watching your career. You know, you've been an advocate. You're always on television. You're always advocating and speaking out for for healthcare, but but things like poverty and housing and, and things like that. And he said, you know, so you're an activist. How would you like to get inside the tent and make a difference rather than banging on the outside? That actually caught my caught my attention. And I said, I can do that. And he said, yeah, yeah, you can make a difference on the inside. Because on the outside, all you're doing is making a noise. So um, I said, OK. And at the time, um, we'd just gone through AIDS. It was in the 80s and, and in Canada and HIV. And I had a lot of patients who were gay. And I thought, you know what? Here is a group of Canadians who, even under our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, did not have access to equality under the law. They were excluded from health care. They were excluded from medical and dental benefits. They were actually were excluded from a whole lot of things. So I said, OK, I'll run if you promise to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act to make sexual orientation a prohibited ground for discrimination. 
And he said, okay, I can do that. And again, smart ass here, I said, can you give it to me in writing? And he did. And, um, and I ran and it turned out that I was running against another woman, which I wasn't happy about. And everything was going smoothly until it turned out that uh, Brian Mulroney, the then conservative prime minister, had uh, resigned and she decided to run for the leadership. Her name was Kim Campbell. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm running against. And, and because and she won and she became the sort of three month prime minister of Canada and unelected, but head of her party, she automatically became prime minister. And I thought, OK, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to write a book and tell my grandchildren how I ran against the prime minister and blah, 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 blah. I didn't think I was going to win. And I won. Um, so I became the first rookie in Canada to defeat a sitting prime minister. And the rest is history. What I ran on, which was to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act to uh, make sexual orientation a prohibited ground for discrimination. Well, once we passed that, we had to move on to all other pieces of legislation that would make the LGBTQ2 um, plus community in Canada equal. Uh, to everyone else. And so we had to then bring in a whole lot of new legislation that would do that. So it was moving in the case of, of making uh, same-sex couples equal uh, to heterosexual common law couples, which was the first move. And then the second one was to ensure that as heterosexual common law couples would have, after a year, they had access to all of the benefits and, and everything that, you know, retirement income and medical and dental benefits, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as, a, as a partner. So that was the second move. The third move then was to was to move towards a same-sex marriage. And uh, we did that. And I think we were, we came in just after Spain had declared and our prime minister was very supportive of all that. As he had said to me, uh, and he had asked me to help to move this agenda forward. And uh, I was in cabinet at the time and I moved it forward and um, worked hard and, and we eventually got to same-sex marriage. That's my proudest thing. But since then I have been <clears throat> looking at issues of human rights. I've been doing a lot of international work when I was a minister in the Christian government, it was for almost uh, looking at human rights in a way. It was about gender equality. We were trying to achieve that. We were also trying to achieve, um, uh, you know, LGBTQ rights continuing onward, trans rights, etc. Um, we were also looking at um, multiculturalism, which, as you well know, is, in, is, is legislated in Canada. And it was to look at ensuring that all of the people, and I mean, Canada is diverse. I think people from every corner of the world come here as immigrants because we are a society built on immigration. Obviously, the First Nations were here, the First Peoples, and that's another story. Um, but, uh, you know, then we, we got everyone else coming from around the world. And so we were this nation, and under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, that Mr. Trudeau brought forward when he had been uh, prime minister, there was a section 15 that talked about equality of all persons and equality of opportunity and equal access, uh, regardless of age, gender, um, of course, sexual orientation got added to that, but regardless of age, gender, race, uh, religion, um, ethnicity, language, etc. So, so my job as Minister for Multiculturalism, as well as uh, gender equality, was to ensure that everyone in this country, regardless of where they were born and regardless of when they came to the country, had equal access to the political, social, economic, and cultural life of the country. That they were able to participate fully in everything. So it was, it was I had to dig deep into the communities, go out and meet them, and, and I really got to understand the, the, the promise of Canada. Being a country that could prove to the world that everyone is able to live together 
with, if you like it, one surname, which is Canadian, but to be coming from every corner of the world, to become citizens within three years of getting here and to fully belong uh, to the country and to fully participate. And, and I thought that, that we were trying to prove really in many ways that if we could all live together coming from parts of the world where we all, there was conflict and people disagreed and people didn't like each other, that actually if we could prove that we could do that here, that we could all live together in peaceful coexistence, that perhaps the world might suggest that there is a way uh, to deal with conflict other than by fighting, and that perhaps we can look at this new way of being, of belonging to something bigger than you, which is the nation of Canada. So that, that was something that really sparked it, and I had to do a lot of that internationally, um, and gender issues we brought to the table internationally after the Beijing conference. So I got very excited about human rights, and so moving forward to a point today where, you know, we now have um, uh, gender and, and uh, LGBTQ and all of these things um, happening as per the Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, happening in the country and a prime minister now, the son of the first prime minister who enticed me by his policies to come to Canada, um, we now see that this is happening. This is taking the next step to become not only enshrined in legislation, but actually in, in public policy and in programs and in working hard. Now, don't get me wrong, women are still facing uh, an uphill battle. Uh, um, let us let COVID-19 showed that in fact, women were, were completely, um, the, the, their vulnerability was completely shown during COVID because many of them had to leave their jobs to stay at home and look after kids because the schools were shut down. Uh, we also saw that, uh, that many women uh, were working in the front line, not just as nurses and, and, and nurses aides and, and, and doctors, but a lot of women were actually working in the low paid, low income jobs at janitorial services, um, food services, etc. And, and, and the exp it exposed that vulnerability. We thought we had a good social safety net. We suddenly saw that the safety net had developed big holes over the period of time and that people were falling through it. Um, so, you know, it became something that continues to, in, to get me moving. It gets my passion going, gets my juices going, you know, um, to make a difference, to make these things happen, to make them so, to make them real and to create the kind of country that was envisioned by Sir Wilfrid Laurier a long, long time ago. We haven't arrived at the point we need to be at um, but we are now finding that COVID showed that we have a great deal of systemic racism. And of course, the colonialization of this country um, by the English and the French of the First Nations people and the residential schools and the horrors coming forward. And Canadians are suddenly realizing uh, what colonialism was about and what residential schools was about. And I think there is a great collective sense that we need to acknowledge that truth and to build reconciliation with indigenous peoples um, and to give them self-determination and self-government. So I think these are important things we're working towards right now. Um, and of course, women are still struggling, as I said, COVID exposed that. So how do we go about to making the move, which is where politics becomes difficult? You may put forward legislation, and we do, we have lots of legislation, the Charter of Rights, uh, a citizenship Act, the, um, you know, equality uh, for, for gender, all of these things are there. Making it from the legislation, which is kind of like a mission statement saying, this is where we want to go. And actually getting there, it means that you have got to identify the barriers that prevent different people, because we now know that there's intersectionality, that people are not just, women are not just agenda, but that women actually may face multiple barriers based on, on their sexual orientation, on their race, on their language, on their religion, on the color of their skin. Some of these things are now bubbling up and we're trying to, to you know, we brought in intersectionality in 1995 uh, to Beijing and we're trying to move forward uh, to, to make sure that, that we are beginning to dig down into that systemic remnant of colonialization, uh, the ability of, of our institutions to still reflect uh, 
uh, some of that and how are we going to change it? I, I would think uh, that being a physician made a lot of difference and being at RCSI made a lot of difference. I, I came from a multicultural country. Trinidad is made up of all races and all religions, etc. all living together for the better part of 450 years, trying to, to exist together and you know, in peaceful coexistence. But but when I came, I actually met people from every other corner of the world because RCSI was one of the medical schools that in fact had, uh, had this diversity of people. And I also learned uh, at RCSI that I was a strong woman and that there were a heck of a lot of strong women in my class at RCSI, the professors, many of them, who were really good role models for us to learn how to be strong and how to be uh, up, up there pushing the envelope and, and doing the things that we need to do and speaking up and speaking out. So I learned that from, from, from RCSI. Um, and so that helped me to move forward. But I also learned um, when I became a family physician, I suddenly realized that my patients taught me that, you know, Health uh, was not just the absence of disease, that in fact, that poverty uh, was the single greatest determinant of health. We know that, but the lack of housing, lack of education, um, lack of equal access to justice. Um, these were some things that I learned in Canada, but I learned it from my patients because I saw um, the reality of my patients' lives and, and I stopped judging. Um, when I came here, I mean, you know, I, don't let's forget, uh, Dublin was very Catholic at the time I was there. And, and it was in Dublin that I learned to become very secular, I'll tell you. Um, but uh, I, when I came here, Canada is a secular nation. Um, and so I actually took what I learned, what I learned from my patient, and I moved it forward into my poli into politics. Because I did realize that Mr. Gretchen was absolutely right. Getting into politics gave me the ability to be inside the tent, changing things. And, and that has stayed with me and I, was, I am still able to do that. This is my 28th year as an MP and there are still windmills to tilt at. There are still things to achieve. I mean, the whole systemic uh, inequality thing, the, the indigenous colonialization and, and, the, and, and what has happened to indigenous people. Um, poverty that was unearthed uh, during COVID. Uh, the, the, the fact that we need to now move from the way we used to do things, changing our institutions, our social institutions, our economic institutions. We can no longer in Canada, we're a wealthy country, but we can no longer go forward to being, you know, drawers of water and hewers of wood, you know, forestry and mining and all of those kinds of things. We need to move into a 21st century economy. I think Ireland embraced that a few, a decade or more ago when you decided that, you know, you have to depend on human resources, what's between your ears is what's going to count and the skills that your people have. And we are now moving there. So that's a huge piece that needs to happen. And it needs to happen so that everyone has an opportunity. And I mean, liberals have always believed that, that the, that a good government helps to create opportunity for all, level the playing field, help people to overcome the barriers that they face um, to, to achieving uh, their, their, best, uh, their best potential. So, I mean, that's all there. That's still needing to happen. We've got a lot to do. And so I am I'm particularly um, excited about running again. <laughs> I am running again. I think physicians have sat back and, and not bellied up to the bar at all. I mean, there are, there are probably three or four physicians in our parliament of 300 plus people. And, you know, physicians don't seem to want to run for politics. And I think the important thing here is that especially um, physicians who are in the cognitive parts of medicine, we understand the interrelationships between people's lives, the social life, the family life, the economic life that they live and their health. And we understand the, the relationship between the environment and health. We understand the relationship between the economy and health. We understand the relationship between social, you know, like a home, a roof over your head, a, a safe and secure place to call home. We get that. We get that. We've seen it firsthand with our patients. And it really saddens me that physicians don't take that plunge. 
you know, if we had more physicians in politics, we might see that kind of understanding of the complexity of public policy. Public policy is not black or white, it's complex. There are many factors that, that create a status or situation in a country. And how do you unravel that it means you've got to look at all of the complexity of it. And so it's kind of sad to me that a lot of doctors don't run. I mean, the ones who do are pretty activists and they're pretty um, gung-ho and they speak up and they and they try to make their voices heard and they have some credibility within caucus. But I mean, I don't, it's, my, it's very surprising to me and I wish more physicians would do this as a public service. It is an extension of practicing medicine because you are making a difference, not to each individual patient at a time, but to the problems and issues that your patients face that you hear every day, like en masse, you're making this, this generic contribution that's gonna make a difference to more people than just one patient at a time. I'm hoping that more doctors would run. I'm hoping, look, it's not easy when you're a physician. You know, everyone thinks you're great. You know, I ran from where I was at a 97% public popularity straight into a, a profession where there was like a 7% public popularity. So I must have been some kind of masochist at the time. But I do think if more and more people run and more and more people bring that, that integrity and the ethics that physicians have and the understanding and knowledge of the complexity of public policy to the table, I think we would find that maybe um, people would start being so, so cynical and so skeptical about politicians. I didn't realize what a natural evolution it was until I first ran. Because I remember when Mr. Christian said to me, uh, and I said, you know, look, I, you know, I think I do a lot of good work with my patients, not just from the point of view of their actual health and disease, but because of all the things that, that, that affect them. And he said, well, you can do this for more than one patient at a time. And I thought that was kind of like a, a sales job he was giving me, right? I have learned this in so many ways. Um, and still have to, to, there are so many, as I said, windmills to tilt, tilt at. There are the people who are substance users, the high rates of, of death coming from fentanyl-laced opioids. Um, the homelessness, the, that ability to look at homelessness and addiction, not, not as, a, as a fault of someone, but as something that comes because of the fact that addiction is a health issue and not a, a, a criminal issue. And, and, you know, changing that and looking at the lives of, of sex workers in this country where they are treated still unequally under the law and they are still not have the equal opportunity uh, to get the help that they need. And COVID exposed that very firmly to me. So there are things to do. There's lots to do still. Of course, climate change, the environment, moving into a post-economic um, world, a post-industrial economic world where we need to have to look at now how to develop human human um, potential, how to develop uh, human, the, the ability of humans uh, to be at the heart of, of any kind of productivity and competitiveness that, that as a country we need to look at globally and to look at how we harness all of the things that the diversity of people in Canada bring to this country and how we can harness that and see it as a, as a net benefit. Uh, you know, these are some of the things that still have to be done and that I've seen and learned. Being a physician is was a natural progression. And that's why I'm still here. People say to me, did you get tired? Don't you want to practice medicine? He said, I am actually practicing medicine in a more holistic way than I ever, ever thought I would.